All right, let's talk about the boiler. So the boiler is 17 stories tall. It is made of tubes that run vertically and continuous tubes from a header at the bottom up to the drum. The water comes from the feed water system. So we'll do a boiler feed pump. And we'll do a little control valve. And then that goes up to the economizer. And that goes into the drum. The water coming down out of the drum. There's four headers that go down and then connect to the boiler tubes themselves, which go up and complete the path. There's two sides to the boiler. And one side is the firebox, and the other side is the back pass. In the back pass, you have tubes running through it that are absorbing heat out of the flue gas. So inside these tubes, you got the fire in the boiler, the, wall, the tubes absorb heat. The heat makes the water in the tubes boil. As the water expands and the bubbles are in it, then that makes it flow up to the drum. And then most of it actually makes another lap and goes around and around. We call this natural circulation. It's natural because, as opposed to forced circulation. In forced circulation, there's a pump. In natural circulation, the difference is thermal. All right. Let's hit the drum. You got a steam drum, and in the bottom there's like this kind of wedge shape that is catching the water and directing it to the downcomers. The feed water coming in goes to two sprinkler headers that run the whole length so that the colder water going in is distributed. And then it flows down the down the downcomer. And then it gets heated up in the tubes. And then the tubes come back in outside. So here in this section, you've got what we call wet saturated steam. So saturated is an engineering term for when uh, water is at that transition point between water and steam. So you add any heat to it and it forms bubbles. And you take any heat away from the steam and it collapses down back into water. There's no actual temperature change, but you're adding energy or taking away energy and it's doing that thing. It's a phase transition. So here the wet steam is channeled up and it goes into a cyclone moisture separator. So it's got this scoop shape to it and it directs the steam and the water up through it. And then the steam goes out the sides and then fills this whole space. And then the water goes down the downcomer and makes it a lap. Let's have some purple there, and then have some blue going down, and we'll have the red like that. Oh man, I'm so good at this. All right. <laughs> so then, up at the top, there's Chevron moisture separators. So the Chevrons. Ooh, I made those too small. So Chevron is French for zigzag. 
And as the steam tries to go through, the steam makes the corners and the water doesn't. And so the water drips back down and makes another lap. And then what we have coming out the top is dry, saturated steam. water in the downcomer, which is physically outside the boiler, goes down, goes with the header, gets heated up, gets less dense, gets steam bubbles, goes up the top. Then you have the moisture separators that separate the steam from the water. The water goes back to the downcomer, and the steam comes out the top. And then to replace the steam comes out, out the top, the feed water comes in all the time. All right, so the steam, dry steam comes out the top, and it makes up the roof. And that makes up the walls of the back pass. And then it comes out of the boiler and goes back in. And it comes out again. What's this section called? Superheat. Primary superheat. Primary superheat. Primary being a fancy word for first. So then that runs back up and goes down here. Hey, what's superheat mean? It's one degree above. Uh, saturation. Okay, so steam is saturated when it is right at that boiling point or condensing point, and it is superheated when we've added more heat to it above that, when it is above the boiling point. Your question? Don't think the one at the bottom come out at the top. No. No. No, it's a Oh, you got me all fucked. Ah. Yeah, I kind of Yeah, no, you're right. You're totally right. Hold on. Counterflow. Counterflow would go up. All right. So the flue gas is going down, and the, the steam pipe's going up, and you were right, and I was wrong. Good catch. Thank you, sir. All right. So then that goes down here to the secondary superheat tubes. Which is also called the radiant superheat. What are the three methods of heat transfer? Radiant, convection, and convection. Conduction, convection, and radiation. All right. So convection is when gas is mixed, where the things are flowing. Conduction is when something hot directly touches something cold. And radiation is like light. So like your, your bathroom heater may have a fan on it, or it may just be radiant heat. All right. So this is, so it goes to the secondary superheat, and then it comes out, and it goes down and makes the tertiary superheat. And then it goes down and makes the final superheat. And then here we come out. And what are our steam conditions? 10, 10, 50, and 20, 20, 1050 Fahrenheit and 2500 PSI. Good answers. All right. Let's see. Yes, yes, excuse me. We got relief valves. got the power operated relief valves which are air operated and he controls them from the DCS. Uh, let's go back to drum. We've got six. Oh yes there are six relief valves on the drum as well. Let's draw me Drum level. And some steam. Let's 
steam. Yeah. And here we are talking about 2,800 PSI and 680 Fahrenheit. All right. How do we control this 1,050 degrees? Temperators. Uh, temperators. <laughs> so we go back up here, upstream the little control valve. Which way am I going to go? Let's go this way. And we tap off on the ninth floor, and we go up to the 15th floor. And we've got a motor block valve flow control valve, and we spray water where? Secondary. Between the primary and the secondary. And then we have another motor block valve, and then that guy splits into two control valves, because you're controlling north and south separately, because this is closer to the end. And where's that going? Tertiary. Between the tertiary and the final. All right. So after that level control valve, we've got a flow venturi. You got a separate flow for the temperators. And then you've got take a check valve first. Oh, man, that's awful. So you got a check valve, and then you've got that chain operated long winded bastard. And then downstream of that, you got a motor operated guy that ties into the down cover. What's that for? Top positive start. So when we're not running full up, we start it up, and we don't have enough water pressure to make it to the come out of the uh, stop by your head. You're on the right path, but I hear you, you're struggling too much. All right. So it is the uh, economizer restart valve. So if you look at it, you know that the pressure on the feed pump is higher than the pressure of the drum because that's the way the water's got to go. And if this valve's open and the feed pump's flowing, then the water is going to go that way and it's going to skip the economizer. That's not what it's designed to do. What it's designed to do is during startup, when you're not using feed water steadily, but you do have fires in there, you got to worry about the water in this tube, these tubes sitting here stagnant and boiling off, and then the tubes overheat. The water has to stay in these tubes. Flow has to be through these tubes all the time to protect them from overheat. <coughs> so the recirc valve is open, and there's no feed water flow in here, so then this, this water in these tubes is hotter and therefore less dense than the water in the downcomer, which is cooler and therefore denser. So natural circulation makes this water flow up and down and make laps to keep the pipes cool. And then, so, oh, go ahead. So the water is not going from pump uh, to recirc. It's, going, it's actually going from downcomer to recirc. It, right, it is the downcomer recirculating into the economizer. When the 142 valve, when the flow valve, the level control valve is shut. If the pump's open, then it goes, the short circuits, it goes the other way. But that's not its purpose. That's something that happens. Uh, when, once we sink, and we know we're going to have steady feed water flow through this all the time, we quit worrying about that, and we shut the research valve so that we get as much preheat out of the water as we can. All right, so these the temperators are taking the feed water and they are spraying it into the steam piping. 
to knock this temperature down to 1,050. Uh, a design thing, you clearly have to have this, this, this that's going into the tertiary, you have to have a superheat section downstream of it to make sure that any water you spray in there gets fully boiled off before you get to the turbine. Because the turbine is meant to have gas in it, steam in it, it's not meant to have water in it. Water is way denser and it's bad for the flames. All right. There are two motor operated vents on the drum. These are open when we're shut down, they're open during startup, and they shut when the unit gets up to 50 pounds. So when all this and all this piping is full of steam and everything's running fine, then it's shut and it's more efficient, right? When all that piping starts cooling down, then as the steam, you know, as steam cools, it collapses back into water, right? As it collapses back into water, it's not taking as much space, it creates a vacuum. So this is kind of like a vacuum breaker. That's what those uh, drum vents are designed for, is to keep, because this drum is able to withstand 2,800 pounds pushing out. It's not designed to control, to resist, pressure pushing in. Okay, uh, also during startup, we have to worry about the warming rate on the drum. So there's a limit of 50 degrees an hour change up until boiling point of the water, and then after that, you're limited to 100 degrees an hour. Uh, What you're worried about is if you're heating the inside of the, well, you're obviously heating the inside of the drum and not the outside, right? The outside is exposed to the air. The inside has this hot water going across it. And if the inside expands and the outside hasn't expanded yet, then you get a pressure pushing out that can cause uh, stress fractures and make your drum not last as long. And we really would like this plant to run another 20 years and I can retire here. Some of those are shooting for 30. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's also a drain off the primary superheat. The 104, and then there's a drain off the walls here. And both of those guys are going to the blowdown tank. orange might be dying. And similar to the research valve, this is all about keeping flow through the system. It's all about making sure that the pipes just have steam to flow through, right? Uh, similarly, down at the turbine, we've got a drain at the on the main steam header. And that's given the steam somewhere to go so that all these secondary and tertiary, all that steam has to have steam flowing through it or else you have the same overheating risk that you do in the economizer. So if the, pre so if the pressure gets too high in the back back or in the back back or the primary superheat, those 104, 105, blowout tank, those lines open up. These, these are not protected from overpressure. These are open during startup, and we close. You pinch back on them, and you finally close them when uh, after the unit sinks, because they're just given a flow path, and they're given a way to drain water out of the system. And they're just given a reason for the water to flow out of the drum and be replaced by feed water. Give it a way to warm up all these pipes and to cool down all these pipes if they've got flue gas going across them, right?
call that for the boiler.